How are you doing, Los Angeles? Boy, there's a lot of you here. It's great to see you. Hi. My name's David, but everyone calls me Bone. Don't, don't ask. Or maybe ask me later. So my job is to oversee all the uh, technical implementation of the UI across the company. And if I'm lucky, I get to do some programming from time to time. At previous CitizenCon, uh, one in the flesh, uh, in Manchester, I talked about UI tech with my um, friend and colleague, Zane Bien. And we were making new tools and technology to help our developers with, uh, to develop their UI. So that was a few years ago now. And now I'm really privileged to share with you how this technology has been utilized by our talented designers to help pr improve your experience in the verse. So along with some of my UI friends that are hidden out the back there, we'd like to show you some of these improvements which are going to help you, the players, navigate the Star Citizen universe. Huh. So why are we doing this? <laughs> well, Star Citizen is big, really big. There's so many unique places, massive planets, moons, space stations, rest stops, you know, there's just loads of places to explore. We have a huge range of spaceships of all shapes and sizes, and there's an enormous amount of things to do and see and people to meet, and all this can be shared with friends online. And as we've seen today, as our uh, amazing online technology grows, it takes great leaps, and our uh, online player count grows, the possibility, possibilities become almost endless. So how are we going to make sense of all this? Hmm. Right. <laughs> well, one of the main ways we do this is with a user interface, or UI for short. Uh, well, that's uh, where we come in, fortunately, being the UI guys. And we do this in loads of ways that you see already, whether it's uh, your vehicle MFDs, or the hood, or the kiosks, uh, where you get your spaceship, or you trade commodities, or buy weapons, and all manner of uh, diegetic UIs that you see, diegetic meaning like things in the world that you can interact with. But our first real opportunity is through the helmet visor display. Now, the visor display gives you vital information about your status and the environment around you. But this this, this display has gone through many iterations over the years, and it's been built upon and adapted. And um, I don't know if uh, who remembers Arena Commander 1.0 that came out. That came out about a year after I started, um, which was primarily space combat and racing. So the, the visor was geared towards that, and then it evolved with our first adventures into the online universe. And as all the features get added and all these new things, the visor grows and we put things on it to show you and now, uh, different statuses and like tells you all about what's going on. But with all this evolution, we sometimes lose focus. There's so much we need to know. And when we need to know it is important. So how do we zero in on what's important and at what time? So leaning on this technology that Zane and I and the UI tech team wrote a few years ago, we're trying to take a smart, smarter perspective and rework the visor for you. So I'm not going to tell you about that. 
I'm going to invite Simon Bursey onto the stage, and he can tell you more about it. Simon? You on this? Hey, everybody. OK, so Star Citizen, as you know, is a big project which has evolved over its lifetime. Early on in the project, we added the visor, which is the display you see on your helmet when you're walking around the universe in first person. Because the game is always expanding, we often add new gameplay features. And with those come new UI. The various teams slotted pieces into whatever, whatever place made sense at the time. But this eventually made the view became very complex. As you can see, the current live UI can get very cluttered. We have lots of information competing for your attention. So you don't always know where to look. And sometimes the overlaps can make things difficult to read. So as you can probably tell, the UI team wanted to do a redesign. We wanted to improve the player's experience by presenting the important information in a clear way. We also needed to create a new framework that supports all the existing features and allows us to add more in future. And finally, we wanted to bring the visuals up to the high standard we're setting for Squadron 42 and soon the Star Citizen Persistent Universe. So how do we go about that? I believe user interface should always be a collaboration with the teams who build the underlying features. So we worked closely with them on a new layout, keeping some pieces, combining others, and maybe getting rid of a few. Once we'd figured out the design, we built a new framework using our 3D UI system. And then we worked closely with the various game teams to take all that complex data that existed before and hook it up to the new user interface. When we designed player-facing UI, we often tried to start with the worst case first, so we can see everything we have to deal with. It was important for us to keep the central area as clear as possible to make it easier for you to see the underlying game. We designed a set of regions to, that attach to the different parts of the view. And with each of those, we have a set of widgets that can show, hide, and stack when you need them. So I've told you about everything we wanted to achieve. But wouldn't it be great to see it in game? Does anybody here want to see a live demonstration? Good. I was hoping you'd say that. Otherwise, it would have been a very short demo. <laughs> OK, so we're going to show you some of our new UI running live in the game. Everything, everything you see is in real time. But I have to tell you, we've created a special mission just for the show, which is a little different to what you see in the live game. OK, so as you can see, Bones driving. Um, I'm going to say Bones' name a lot and the other guys too. So it's probably the most times you'll hear that in any presentation. OK, welcome to the Orison Providence platform. You may, have spotted it early, you may have spotted it earlier, but today is the first time we've shown the new visor we developed and tested in Squadron 42. But you'll be happy to know all the UI you see today is going to make its way to Star Citizen. But this is secret UEE Navy tech, so we'll give it a different look for the persistent universe. As you can see, the display is very clean by default. Many of the elements are contextual, meaning they appear when you need them to avoid cluttering the screen. We've also temporarily hidden a couple of things so we can focus on them later in this demo. OK, Bo, let's move into the scene, please. All right. OK, when we get a new mission objective, it appears in the top right of the screen. And you can see that our first mission is to repair a radiation leak. We've done a major overhaul of the augmented reality marker system so we can follow the yellow on-screen marker to get to our objective. At the top of the screen, you'll also see the compass. OK, Bone, let's head towards the objective. We were, already we were already happy with the way the player status widgets worked, showing you contextual information about your character and environment. So we've given them some visual polish and added a few new ones. The environmental radiation here is quite high, and over time, it will wear down our suit and damage the player. Looks like we can see the source of the radiation there. I think somebody's damaged a pipe, so how are we going to fix it? If we were in space, we could use a salvage and repair ship. Luckily, 
UEE have some advanced portable tech. Bone, please equip the military multi-tool. The military multi-tool from Squadron 42 has various modes, one of, the, one of which gives us the ability to salvage and repair on, while on foot. OK, Bone, let's use the multi-tool to repair that pipe. OK. Right, we can see at the bottom left of the screen the radiation levels are de decreasing. So let's head into the scene. Go on, Bone. Let's walk forwards a bit. OK, now we fixed the damage. We need to find the enemies that caused it. While we're on the way, you'll notice that the on-foot emissions are at the top of the screen. We're emitting infrared, electromagnetic radiation, and also sound. If any of these go higher than the background levels, it will be easier for the enemies to detect us. Let's take a look at the bad guys, Bone. As part of the emissions and radar tech, we also have the ability to scan while we're on foot. If we tap the button, we can do a quick scan to reveal everything, to reveal info about anything that's in our, in our view currently. OK, Bone, let's do a quick scan. This highlights whatever's in our line of sight. There's also some risk and reward to the scanning system. By holding the button, we can charge our scanner, and this reveals, this reveals enemies through walls using a more powerful wave. But it does cause a spike in our emissions, which makes us easier to detect. OK, let's do a charge scan, please, Bone. OK, we can also see the augmented reality box outs, which give us a summary of what we've detected. OK, let's have a look at our weapons. Let's get the gun out, gun out please, Bone. OK, we wanted to help the player see their equipment during combat, so we upgraded the weapons display. As well as the ammo in the gun and the spare mags in their pockets, we also now show the player's explosives and med pens. OK, let's fight the bad guys. There you can see our new explosives marker, designed to help you spot deadly grenades, mines, and missiles more easily. I got you covered. Did you do it? Okay. Well done, Bone. Success. OK. Uh, there's no more hostiles nearby, so let's take a moment to talk about the Moby Glass. The Moby Glass is the Star Citizen equivalent of your smartphone. It has various apps that hook into the gameplay systems. Like all the UI we're showing you today, we wanted to redesign it with the player's usability in mind to make it look good and also lay the, lay the groundwork for future expansion. Uh, let's bring up the Moby Glass, please, Bone. Pretty cool, huh? We've redesigned the interface to give a smoother user experience. We've overhauled the visuals, as you can see, to make it feel more three-dimensional and holographic. This is actually a sneak peek of the UEE military mobile glass we've created for Squadron 42. This version has a focused selection of apps, and we're going to expand on that when we bring the mobile glass to the Star Citizen Persistent Universe. We'll also have more of a smartphone feel in the PU with a wider range of apps. OK, let's briefly talk about this home screen. It gives us an overview of our health, the environment, and even our ship. We can also check our mission objective. 
Okay, so that's enough about the Moby Glass. Uh, we've got some more really cool UI just around the corner. And to tell you a bit more about that is the very talented Zane Bien. Throughout human history, as we have ventured towards the allure of the unknown, we have used cartography as a key component to help shape our understanding and make sense of the world around us. Without these systems in place to catalog our experiences and to chart our journeys, we are forever lost amidst our own environment, and we are just running around aimlessly. This is why it is super important that you, as citizens of our ever-growing, ever-evolving, persist ever persistent universe, are equipped with the tools necessary to make your ventures meaningful. So with that said, I want to show you something extremely, that I think is extremely cool. So Bone, our next objecti objective is to go to the map kiosk and download a terminal. Let's go ahead and activate it. What you see on screen, zoom out a bit, what you see on screen is a fully live 3D representation of the environment that we are in. You can see callouts of the various default points of interest. You can pan the map around, you can rotate it, and you can even cycle the floors that you're on to isolate the visuals of the floor that you're on. So our current objective, it's much more interesting if we can actually take this on the go. So let's download it to our data bank. As you'll notice, we now have the representation of the environment in, our, in the upper left corner of our visor. Now, the thing that's really interesting to note at this point is not all environments will have such a convenient kiosk available. You may encounter rundown settlements, or you might come across a cave that no one else has ever set foot on before. What will happen in this instance is your radar will incrementally update your map, and it will incrementally reveal uh, your environment and save that to your databank. So you kind of reveal it incrementally. So the, this map, what we see in the upper left cor uh, corner of our visor, is not really just a map. What it really is is actually data. It's our radar. And we can see contacts on our radar as we scan. And it's basically uh, what we have available in, in, in stored in our data bank. So because we have the, the location data saved to our data bank, we can obviously access that via our Moby Glass. So let's go ahead and pull it up in our Moby Glass because this is going to get really interesting. So, Bone, I would like you to cycle the, between the different floors for us, please. So you can see this lurping transition between the different floors and marker callouts of our objective and also where we are. I would like to talk a little bit about the tech behind this. What you're seeing is not a pre-baked asset. And I want to reiterate that because all of, our all of our environments can be very dynamic and they can change. They can take damage. Perhaps uh, economic shifts might cause changes in the environment. And we can't export a totally custom assets 
Um, so what we've done is we collaborated with our graphics team to enable us to render the environment in this way. And what it is is we're actually whitelisting objects that we render and excluding everything that we don't need to render. So in our level markup, we basically have the designers and artists mark up only the bits that are necessary for the map. This lets us have a, a very compelling visual, but without much of the cost. So I think what we can do at this point, what I want to show you is something very interesting. So we might look around on this map and note down certain areas that might look interesting that we might want to revisit later. We can see some doors on this map. And these doors are, various, are, are entities that are called out on the map. And they may change state. So there can be some doors which have a locked state, which they will display red. And doors that are open will be green. And there are other entity callouts that can happen in our map. So let's go ahead and find a location to, to put down a pin, please, Bone. Maybe that one. Maybe that door looks interesting. Press T. So what we can do is set a marker, and we can customize, we can customize the details of that marker. Now, what you'll notice as well is as we set markers, there's metadata that is encoded into each of these markers on top of the customized name that we can specify. So we can mark as many markers as we want in this map. And these are all saved to our data bank. And we can sh eventually share these markers and even sell these markers on, a, on the market. So the thing about this, we can't really talk about markers without, going, without mentioning data running. So you might specialize in exploration, whereas perhaps a miner might specialize in the equipment, and they may make investments in their equipment. So you, as an explorer, might be in the business of going around and exploring and finding locations that are very valuable to other professions. And the role of these markers are very important in uh, coming up with the data and um, yeah, so it's very important. We can cut, basically, when you name your markers, you can, you can make it as uh, uh, maybe obvious, or you can leave it a mystery. So you'll have, uh, when you sell it on the market, you, you could get rated for how accurate the data is. So the other thing is we have a mission objective as well. And it would be very nice to be able to route to that mission objective. How do we get there? That is another purpose of the map, is basically navigating and, sh and letting us know the way towards that objective, uh, towards a destination. So let's go ahead and plot a route to this objective. So we can see a line being drawn from where we are up the stairs to our destination and where we want to go. So you will no longer be lost amidst all of our super complex environments. And what's worth mentioning at this, at this point, and what's really cool, is this under the hood is actually utilizing another piece of tech, AI pathfinding. And so what that allows us to do is leverage other existing tech 
to basically, uh, they, it does all the heavy lifting. We just make it look pretty. So because of that, there are certain cases where the path might be blocked. It might have a locked door. Or there might be a fire uh, that is in our way. The AI pathfinding will account for that. It will go through doors. It will handle elevators. And it will handle fires, locked doors. And it will just handle everything. So that is an example of sort of a piece of tech that we've leveraged under the hood to help us achieve this goal. So, one last thing we can do at the moment is we want to make sure, we want to ensure that there are no more hostiles in our way as we make our way to our objective. So, what we can do is we can send out a ping. Bone, if you send out a ping, please. So the scanning will also be represented in the map in the, sa in the same fashion as it is when you're in FPS. So we know that there's no more hostiles. Let's go ahead and make our way to our objective. As you can see in the upper left corner, we now have the route line represented, our destination, and the distance it takes to get there. As we traverse this path, the path automatically updates and if you deviate from that path, it will recalculate the route you need to get to your destination. So there's our buddy. He's flying in. So we'll make our way up to the Carrick here, to the right. You'll also notice the pin that we've laid down, as well as our marker objective called out on the map. And as you'll notice, as we head up the stairs, the floor will, be, will dynamically change as you head up the stairs. If we can, if we can get past this first thing, if we don't trip up. So as we make our way into the Carrick, it's not just environments or caves or cities we can represent the ship on our interior map. And it's totally seamless as you transition between the two. So let's go ahead and pull up our Moby Glass again and get a wider view of our ship. So we are now on the technical deck but we can also see the other floors. If you traverse the floors bone, just to demonstrate it, here's our cartography deck. Down one, and our habitation deck. So you will have noticed from a previous presentation that this was very similar looking, right? It's utilizing our tech. So not only will this benefit you as a player, but it also benefits us as developers. Because we generalize this system to, so that other developers can leverage our map to create compelling gameplay. So other teams can utilize leverage our tech, and we leverage the tech from other teams, and it's a circle of life. And I think that's just too cool for school. <laughs> so we've been talking about environments, cities, representing ships on our map, maybe planet terrain. These are quite, I mean, our, our universe is quite big, right? That's only a small fraction of what our universe is. 
what if, what if, what happens? Have we, have we tried this? Have we, what happens if we just, just take your mouse wheel and just zoom out a little bit? Keep going. Zo keep zooming out all the way out, all the way out. Let's go, let's go. So it's not just the interior map. It's not just the radar. It is the map. It is one single unified system just across different scales. And I want, at this point, We are above Crusader, and at this point, I want to invite Emily Hansen onto the stage to talk about the map as seen at this scale. Thank you very much, everybody. Hello, SystemCon. Are you ready for this? Fine. <laughs> Do you want to click on the marker? As you all suspected, this is the star map. I'm so excited to be here today to reveal this to you all. I hope you're excited too. Now, I think we all know the current star map needed a bit of work, and we've done that. Now, mapping the universe is no easy task, but we've taken some big steps forward with this upgrade to make it so much easier for you to navigate the stars. Before we dive into the details, let's just take a second to admire Crusader's new look. Bone, why don't you take a look around? Much like the interior map, the star map is holographic. And this lets us add some cool interference effects and details to our planet textures. You can also see our improved player marker and that we're currently at Orison. The player and location markers have merged at this scale because they're so close together. The player marker takes priority, which is why the marker displays the player icon and color. By smartly merging with bigger points of interest at larger scales, the player marker always remains visible to you. You'll always know where you are relative to points of interest near and far. So, is everyone ready to see more? Yeah. Bone, let's take the step back button. That's the one on the right over here. So we can see, look, take a look at Crusader and all of its moons. Yeah, so here we are, Crusader, its moons, orbits. You can also see that labels have received a major visual update. They're now fully 3D, and this gives them a really cool perspective. Most labels are aligned to the galactic plane, and they rotate with the map. Bone, give the map a spin. Bone, can you tilt past the horizon, please? When we do this, the labels flip so you can always read them clearly. <laughs> labels for city markers and outposts work a little bit differently. Bone, let's double click on cell in now to focus on it. Surface labels face the camera and appear when they're in the central part of the planet, reducing on-screen clutter. Bone, want to show this in action? <laughs> Markers on the far side of the planet fade out, so they don't take focus from the locations you currently care more about on the near side of the planet. Bone, can you double-click on one of the points of interest? As we selected this marker, its label will stay visible at all angles. 
So far, we've showed you that you can use buttons and double-clicking to jump to objects you're interested in. But wouldn't it be nice if you could also freely zoom out and into locations? Shall we try it, Bone? Let's zoom out until we can see Crusader. We wanted to ensure you have freedom to move around, but this flexibility requires us to be really careful about how and when markers appear. Markers need to disappear when they get too small, but also stay visible when they're still relevant to your view. This isn't simple because objects in a solar system are vastly different sizes. Think about the size of a star versus a planet versus you, the player. You're kind of small compared to a star, right? Our solution is a technique we call cosmetic scaling. This allows us to draw a marker at its real size when we are close to it and artificially increase its size as we zoom out until we reach the point where it collapses into larger points of interest in the hierarchy. You can see this in action here. There's no way Crusader and its moons are this size at this scale in reality. They've been scaled up massively so you can see them. Bone, let's zoom out a bit more so we can see the moons disappear. You can also start to see Crusader's orbit line around the sun here. But before we go back, to the, before we move on to that, let's zoom back in so we can see everything come back as we get closer. As well as zoom, you can also pan around the map unrestricted. Bone, feel free to have a quick look around. As we draw closer to a marker, the cursor automatically magnetizes to it. This ensures you never lose track of what you're trying to view when you zoom in. No more zooming in on empty space. Yeah. Bone, let's use this technique to take a closer look at Yela. The magnetic cursor does not require us to click on markers. Keep zooming in. Bone, can you keep zooming in? Thank you. You can see that the surface markers appear without us needing to select Yaler itself. Imagine how much easier finding that outpost will be now. <laughs> Crusader, as you all know, isn't all there is, though. We've got a pretty big uh, universe out here. Do you want to see some more? Yeah. Let's have a look at the location further afield. Can we just pan to Calliope, maybe? Bone, let's give that a try. Yeah, uh, I think we're getting lost. Pretty sure we can all disagree this might not be the best strategy. So what can we do? Bone, let's try clicking on the middle button over here. This returns us to our previously selected marker. As I mentioned, we did not select Yela, so we've gone back to Selin. So now we know where we are. That's a step in the right direction. But we're still not at Calliope. So we need to find a different way. Bone, could you take a step could you use the step back button until we can see the whole solar system, please? And there it is. I think Calliope is one of Microtex moons. So if we double click on that bone, we should be able to see it. And there it is. Bone, let's pan to it and then zoom in so we can see that magnetic cursor in action again. Can you zoom in, Bone? Thank you. It's so cool to see more of our moons and planets and how different they all look. Okay, so this is great. 
But what if I hadn't already known where Calliope was? Surely there's a faster way. We've got you. We've provided a drop down that lists the points of interest in the solar system. Bone? Want to expand it now? We're actively working on ways to improve the way this list is presented to you, to make it even easier to find what you're looking for. And yes, this will include search functionality. But for now, Bone, let's use this to go to Arial. I absolutely love zooming around on this map. Phone, want to find area 18 for me? <laughs> so, area 18 is currently on the dark side of the planet, it seems. Of course, it's not just planets and moons. Phone, how about we take a look at security post Korea? It's quite a long way down, isn't it? This is where the upcoming search will really come in useful. Bone, want to zoom in a little and show off our holographic model of this station? Bone, can you also um, drop the drop down again, please? Thank you. As you may have noticed, the recent list in the dropdown populates as you click on locations in the list. It will remember your three most recent selections, so you can use this to quickly return to places in case you want to check something else again. Bone, let's use this to go back to Ariel. OK. So we've done a lot of exploring. I think it's time that we head back. We could do this by selecting Orison from the list, but we also have our own marker that we can take advantage of here. The eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed that the player marker clamps to the edge of the map, keeping it visible to you no matter how far away you go. To get back to our position, we could double-click that marker, or we could click the first of the navigation buttons to zoom straight there. Now, I'm sure many of you have been wondering if we can go back to our Karak map from the star map, just like how we got here from the Karak map just a few minutes ago. So let's see what happens when we focus on our player marker. Go ahead, Ben. So yeah, here's Icaric again. Being able to simply zoom between these map contexts lets you draw meaningful connections between what's on the ground and what's in the skies like never before. Bone, just for fun, let's zoom all the way back out so we can see the entire Stanton solar system. It's just so cool to watch the verse open up before our eyes. With all these new possibilities for moving around the star map, you should never find yourself lost again. The controls are so much smoother and easier to use than the star map you're all used to, as I hope Bone agrees. Knowing that what we've shown here today is just the beginning for the upgraded star map. You saw pinning in the local map, and we'll add this to the star map before you get it. Just imagine being able to mark something interesting you find out there in the verse and then sharing that location with friends, just like Zane said. Exploration is about to get a lot more interesting, and we're doing everything we can to ensure the star map is your brightest window to the stars yet. And 
now, let's welcome our intrepid demo driver, Bone, back to the stage. Hi. Thanks, Emily. Thanks a lot. So we're really, really excited about getting all these features into your hands um, of the players of Star Citizen and Squadron 42. We know they're going to make a huge difference to the way you make your way around the universe. So let's just quickly review what we've seen. We've rebuilt the visor display to give you a better understanding of the environment around you. With the new minimap, with the integrated radar and ping, and it will help you find your way around. There's a new Mobiglass coming with its sleek new design. We're improving all the existing apps, and we're going to develop some new ones too along the way. So we've got a video now. And then there's our interior map technology, which will truly help you understand your surroundings. Better awareness of your surroundings and threats, exploring new map and mapping new areas, pinning locations for later and sharing these with your friends. Or the Idris. That looks great. Some more of Horizon. Horizon. And of course, our entirely new integrated star map with its new interface and, let's face it, a much needed refresh to the user experience. No more getting lost. A whole new perspective. With all these upcoming features, where will you explore today? Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs>